these are, you said, the, say it again. These are the monsters from the monster manual for Dungeons and Dragons. All the way up to number 87. Number 87 out of well over a thousand. Oh gosh, and your goal is to... To print and paint every single one of them. I'm going to need a bigger house. You're going to need a bigger So what you do is you set your, your little fence, that's what this thing is, it's a fence, you set it, tighten it down to how thick you want your to be, your foam to be. And this right here is your, it's your uh, intensity control, it, it dials up the power that runs to this thing. So I flip it on, my little light comes on, shows that it's on, if I dial it up all the way, watch the wire. It gets pretty hot, now I can touch yeah. my finger to that, see? It left a little stripe on my finger. Barely felt it though. So, but you don't need to run it that high. Normally, I run it at about medium, and then you put your little block on there. And it just slices right through it, and it's a nice, clean cut. Yep. And I dropped it before. But then that's my little brick. So normally. Okay, so would you say that the game inspired the art here? Yes, definitely. I had absolutely no intent of ever building or making any of this stuff until I started playing this game, which I told her, the game's only 15 bucks. It's literally almost free. <laughs> and now I've got thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours invested in this game, and that's not even counting what time we sit and play it. That's just me building and making things so that my players can have a better time when they sit down to play. Because this... It's a whole lot more fun to sit down at the table and take your little mini and say, your character enters the dungeon and sees a giant frog and actually have it on the table rather than us just sitting around the table with nothing on it saying, you walk into the dungeon and see a giant frog. It's more, right. it's boring. So this is exciting. This keeps you, this keeps you, uh, sword. You're, you're, you're not only imaginatively engaged, right. but you're it's, visually engaged with what's going on. Um, what you do is you create what's called verisimilitude, which means that you're making what you're talking about seem more like real life. And if you can get your verisimilitude to a high enough level, you will cause your players to have something called suspension of disbelief, which is they get to the point to where they're so invested in the game that they forget that it's a game. They want to kill that giant frog because that giant frog's trying to kill them. Not because it's a video game and we're all just sitting around joking and having fun, but they actually get so invested in the game that it, that it, 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 it just ups the levels of fun that you're going to have. Nobody's fooled. Nobody thinks we're really in a dungeon. Don't take right. it wrong. But those are the terms, and, and, and those, are, those are terms that writers use when they're writing a book. That's why writers are so descriptive. You right. have, uh, like one of my favorite authors is R.A. Salvatore. His fight scenes where one character is fighting one orc will go for 10 pages and it's so detailed down to the turn of the blade every time the blades hit and it, but it's so good that it, 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 it gets you into it like you're standing there watching it and then you're not reading a book you're there right. you're in the battle and that is verisimilitude causing suspension of disbelief those are big words right yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same goal that you're, it's the you're same after. goal as as a dungeon master that is my goal my goal is to make the game so much fun for them and to have visuals that are so high detailed and quality that when they're playing it's not a game this is a real this is not oh this guy wants to get the treasure this is this guy is in a fight for his life against whatever this bad guy over here is that's guarding the treasure hoard that has the sacred relic that he has to return to the church. It, it, it has to be real or you're not invested. And then yeah. if you're not invested, it's, you might as well be playing Monopoly. Right. So the more invested you are in what you're doing, the more fun you have. And I'm talking about if, when you really get into it, like I will do it, they won't do it. Jackson will, Lily, or, uh, Lily and Jenny don't. I'll do, I'll do character voices. When my paladin enters the room and there's like a bad guy, I mean, I'm like banging my hammer on my shield and I'm like, I challenge you. I, I, I get I bet. It. I bet. It's because, I don't doubt <laughs> no, it's, that's what makes the game fun. Right. That's the whole point of this type of a game is you can be your character. Right. You're not just a character in a video game. That is you. 
Right. And that's what makes these types of games, role-playing games, especially tabletop, fun. Because you're not only playing a game, but you're interacting directly with your friends. You're not connected to them over the internet where they can only hear you if you push the mic button. Right. You're sitting right there. So every decision you make in this game has effects. And that's what makes this game so much fun. It's unlike the video games where the only things you can do is what the game designer wrote into the code of the game. In this game, I can do anything. If I walk down in there and I see those giant frogs, I can go, nope, and I can turn around and walk back out. I can turn around and tell my party members, this is what's happening, this is what I see, and then we can make a plan. Or what I normally do is just run in sling it. And then it's up to the dungeon master to account for that. So this game has endless possibilities because there's no coding, there's no script. I can do right. anything I want to do. Right. When I go talk to the innkeeper and the innkeeper tells me, oh, it's ten pieces of gold per night, if I think he's ripping me off, I can I can fight him. Or if I think he stole something out of my room in the night, I can go in there and punch him in the face and try to get it back. But it's my decision. Right. Now, my decision may have ramifications, just like real life. Right. He may summon the local constabulatory and I may go to jail. <laughs> right. But that's all up to the dungeon master. And that's what makes this game so much more fun than a video game on your computer or on your console is the limitless possibilities that right. you can do with it. Right. That's also what makes it insanely frustrating for your dungeon master. Because as a dungeon master, I can tell you, you will plan out the world's best game. You'll have four hours of the most epic content in the world. And at the very beginning of the very first five minutes of the game... One of your characters will go, okay, I want to look around. What do I see? And then just like, you'll flippantly go, okay, there's some people over here talking, and over here you see, you know, a butterfly, and over there there's a dog barking. And they'll go, I want to go over that dog is. He's barking at something. And you're like, no, 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 I just made that up. But you can't tell them that <laughs> right. because that breaks the, the suspension of disbelief. You have right. to go, okay, when you walk over. And then I'm winging it at that point right. because this is not in my four-hour script. Right. And that's what they do every single time. Or, literally, we went through a, what was it, it was a two-month-long campaign to kill a vampire. Think like Bram Stoker's Dracula. The story is written in the sense of Bram Stoker's Dracula, like very dark, very creepy, very dismal, very, very dark uh, villages. The people are very just dour. And when we get to the big end battle, they kill him in, what, three hits? This epic vampire lord, this battle that's supposed to take a minimum of an hour that he's down in three minutes, and I'm literally just sitting there going, I got nothing. You win. That was that. Because yeah. what do you say at that point? <laughs> how funny. So, like, how, how is there a winner? That's the thing about this game. There is no winner. The game never ends. Okay. The only way you win is by surviving. All right. It's not but you can a, die. You can die. Like, if... Uh, all the hours I put into painting and printing and making him, if he dies, he goes on the shelf. And I roll up a new character, and then after that game's over, I come out here, and I design a new one and print it, and, make it. So, and I hope that one doesn't die. So this is not just a wall of characters, or, like, this is, this is actually all part of what you have currently going as well. Like, not all of it. Not all Some of, of these are from different games, di different um, different storylines we played through. Okay. Some of them are pieces that I made specifically for, they were in the forest one time and they were fighting these um, giant spiders, which I've got the giant spiders right here. Giant spider. Printed a bunch of those up and painted them. I got some nicer ones that have like glitter paint that look really cool. But the giant spiders were being controlled by these giant arachnid-like humanoids called edder caps. And then, so I had to print up some edder caps to go fight them. So cool. But, and so, but now, as a group, you can decide, like, you know what, we're done with this storyline, or does that not usually happen? Well, you don't, you don't phrase it that way in the game. You, okay. go, you just go, <laughs> okay, we're getting our butt kicked. Why don't we go back to town and resupply? And then you go back to town and then resupply. But the thing is, it's like if you go back to town and rest up and heal up from your wounds and resupply and buy more potions and get better weapons, when you go back, well, the enemies have... They, they, they fortified their, their stronghold. They've changed up the way they guard the place. They've moved to a different... You can't even find them anymore. They've packed up and moved. And now, this isn't like normal video games where you run in, you kill a few guys, you get hurt too bad, you run outside, heal up, and go back in. No. It, just like in real life, if you attack the enemy and then leave, they reestablish their foothold, they fortify their... And the next time you come back, it's harder. Oh. So, you don't leave. You fight until you're dead. Wow. <laughs> 
So you talked about like printing these um, characters as needed. Will you talk one more time now that I have you on video about the process of making before you started printing and even still now when you have something with the foam board or with the cord? Okay. Can I actually, okay. You, what, you want the process of how I do it? Yeah, just okay. talk a little bit, show okay. us about what you I, were I can up to. show you the very first thing that I ever made. Okay. For the very first story, the story starts out with you're traveling down the road and you come across two dead horses laying on the road in front of you. And these are the very first things that I made. That one's really dead. That is a very dead horse. <laughs> yeah. So these are... These are from the Dollar Tree. They're just the little horses. But what I did is, because they're stiff and their legs don't bend down, right. I heated them up in the microwave until the plastic got flexible and then I bent <laughs> it down and glued it. This one, I heated up a bit too long and the entire head melted, so I decided to run with it. And it worked. <laughs> I, made a, I made a headless horse. But it was okay because when my players go, well, what happened to his head? I'm like, the goblins probably chopped it off and took it back as a trophy. Definitely. That just adds to the story. <laughs> but no, I mean, I've got drawers and drawers full of things that I've made. Bridges. Oh, here's a here's a, a note that they found that leads them on a, uh, on a quest to find whatever. I don't even remember. So cool. Yeah, but I, I made that and printed it out, and then I dipped it in coffee to give it the old look. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I got prison bars here. If you want to have a little gel cell, you drop those in. I got little tombs that open up. That and those time, are foam board? These are all foam board. They're made out of foam cord. And I've got a house over there that I'm actually building right now that's built out of foam cord. And I'm working on it. And I can actually show you a little bit about how to do that. Yeah. Hold on, man. It's actually modular. What? I can take it apart. I can actually build more wall and it all just locks together. This is so cool. But I build it to scale to the minis so that it's playable. You can build on the table and you can play. Wow. The roof is like a terracotta style roof. I actually mm -hmm. printed the roof. I found a 3D terracotta print. And so I just printed the roof tiles, and that saved me a massive amount of time. I bet. But the blocks, the woodwork, the stone, it's its actually wrapped around a box of peaches that Jimmy bought for the kids. And I'm like, I can use the peach box as a frame. Fantastic. But what I do is I take my foam. That I have. And I lay it out, and I got my name. My, table here with my measurements on it and so I'm just going to cut something real quick to show you how easy it is to do this like with the textures and all because I used to have to cut all of the stonework like the stonework in that every single block is cut by hand with an oh, eight pen. I gosh. spent hours and hours and hours carving stone blocks into that. Yeah. Now a after I did that I came to her and I went I gotta buy something for this. So just Exacto knife and foam board so far. Yep. But the great thing about the Dollar Tree foam board, the glue they used to glue the paper on, peels right off. So I take it, peel it off. Sometimes it comes off very easily. Sometimes you gotta kind of roll it with your fingers to get it to come off. And then once you get it off, and now. Anyway, I bought these, which are, they come all the way from Europe. They're textured rolling pins, and they're made just for this, this purpose. Say if I wanted to do like the cobblestone kind of wall on that one, I get my one that's labeled cobblestone. And then I take it, and I lay it on here, and I just press it in, and roll it across. Now it has the cobblestone texture. That is so cool. Now I can do the same thing on the other side. Normally you only do one side because the other side gets glued to something, but like if I wanted to do wood floors or a wooden wall, like like the top of this is wood, I get the wood one. And they sell hundreds of different textures. I only have the three that I wanted. There's a 
with wooden planks. Now it's hard to see. I can see it pretty well in this video and, too. But yeah, but then, show us. But then to paint it. This is why most of my paints still have the wrapper on the top. Because I don't actually squirt them. I just, right. <laughs> just turn the cap upside down. Because I'm using small amounts of paint when I do this. Right. But I paint it like this is chocolate. So I'll paint the wood. I come into the room all the time just covered in paint. Oh, I bet. Thank you. But then once that dries, it'll take it'll take just a minute to dry. Right. Then I just add a second coat of different color. Like I'll, I'll use a lighter brown right. and I'll do uh, it's a technique called dry brushing. I don't know if you do it in your painting. And it just adds kind of a weathered look to it. Yeah. And then I've got these up here. I've got so these are they're called washes. Okay. And basically it's a little bit of paint and a whole lot of water. Right. And you paint it on there and then when the water dries off the little bits of paint, like with the black wash, the black paint will settle down into the cracks and crevices, right. and it'll give it a, it's like instant shadow and depth. I don't right. actually have to know how to paint shadow and depth. I can paint it, throw a wash. wash on it, and it's good enough to put on the table. It's not professional quality artwork here, but, but it looks it's, good. it's good enough. And then I've got, these are the washes I use on my minis. These are actually, instead of, these are water and craft paint. Mm -hmm. These washes, I make a little bit better quality. I make them out of artist inks and alcohol. I use the artist inks because on the minis that are this big, the pigment in the paint is large grains of pigment, right. so it makes the minis look gloppy and bad. Mm -hmm. The ink has very fine pigment in it, and if I mix it with alcohol instead of water, I can literally just spritz it on with a spritz bottle, and it's dry in like a minute and a half, and then I'm done. Right. So I don't have to wait you know, an hour or two for everything to dry. So. Let's try it on. We'll move on. Then I come over here and I'll grab me a territorial beige. Just a little bit of paint on it. Can you see the difference down here where I did it? Yes. It's starting. It, I mean, if I, I, let the, the paint, I the video shows it. If I let the paint dry more, it shows up better. Sure. Right now it's just kind of blending because it's a little wet. Right. But it'll give it some depth too yeah. to have but the Yeah. But what I'll do is I'll make, like if I'm making like the dungeon tiles, I used to make, I have, I have boxes of these things that are handmade out of foam over there. And I would literally make a hundred of these things and have them all laid out. So by the time I got done painting the last one, the first one was dry and I could right. go back to it. <clears throat> But you throw that on there, and that gives it a little bit of a weathered look. Okay, the wood's not all the same color. Right. And then I take on the black wash. And then you have a much more realistic wood yeah. look. Now you can see where some of the paints are. Sure, of course. I, I, I we're look. rushing it, right? Yeah, we're rushing. <laughs> Normally, I mean, like I would say, I would have this desk would be full of tiles that I'm making. 
Right. And when I paint the house, I'll wait till I'm done and I'll do that. Now that I'm going to paint a lot more carefully and I'll have the super fine detail brushes to get down right. so my colors don't mix and stuff. But That's fantastic. So you have you would you say that you've learned a lot about paints and yes. <laughs> my my experience with painting when I started this was literally uh they sell paint that's not for your house. Right. Uh, <laughs> now now every time we go to Walmart I tell her be back in a minute and I'm over at the arts and crafts album and they have new colors right because I don't have enough shades of green and brown and gray yet I need more of course <laughs> so funny wow no, that's very cool thanks for sharing that process that was just something I was testing let me grab my chair this one foot X, one foot Y, and then 15 inches Z axis. And printers are big on X, Y, Z. It's all three dimensional. So Z is a whole new thing. Z is high. I know X and Y. X. Now I get it. Z is, Z is up. up. Right. See, and you can tell what the different things are over here. Like the uh, the yellow is the infill. That's the part you don't see. That's just the support structure it builds inside. The green is the inner wall. The red is the shell. The shell is the part that's out that you see. So, and then the light blue is the supports. The helpers is called, but it's, it's the supports for them. I've never seen a tree. Yeah, right, that is. Yeah. They used to. That's all you, you'd hear. Every one of those motors. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I've never seen a tree. Yeah. Now, see, long, it's got. How long would it take this thing to print it? What that many? It's going to take just under an hour, like fifty-eight minutes, I think it said. Mommy, can we please stay for it to print? <laughs> You're more than welcome to. I got Well, I got a little scraper, and I have to scrape it off because it sticks to the top of the uh, the build plate, is what this is called. And that is what it looks like. But you see how it's all gooey and wet with the resin? Yes. So this resin is mildly toxic. So to get it off, I have alcohol and a big bottle. You just drop it in the alcohol. So this is just taking the stickiness off of it? Yeah, it's getting all the resin off of it that didn't get hardened. Because you don't want it touching your skin because when it's when it's cured, it's safe. When it's still uncured, it's not safe. So there is the mini in super high quality. Now all these little bars on the back are called supports. The printer has to print them in order to attach it to the build plate. So to get these off, you literally just grab them. And this is why there's plastic all over the floor. And there's not a danger of messing up what you just printed? I mean there is, but you just you just you be careful. You just very gently tug at it until it breaks off. Almost like when you would buy board games and you have to snap the pieces yeah, out of much, the pretty much, pretty much. Step on that because it'll go through your foot. And what is this piece that you've printed? This is a character that Jackson made. There's a website where you can go and you can you can make your own character. 
down to the facial expression, how far apart their eyes are, what clothes they're wearing, what they're holding in their hands, what's at their feet. I mean, it's very detailed. But you create your own character, and then when you're done, it gives you a 3D model that you can plug into your printer and print. Okay, so now I've got this, but you've got these little, like, burrs all over the back of it. You see the little divots where the supports contacted it? I've got a set of files in my drawer over there, and if I'm really serious about it, I'll sit here and file all those down smooth. I'm not going to do that to this one, but... Get it to focus in really good on that. Yeah, good luck. I, cool. I, I spend hours out here trying to take oh, pictures Oh, I of bet, these I bet. Because I don't have a camera that has a macro. <laughs> But that's it, and then what I'll typically do with him is I'll take him and I'll set him out in the sun, but it's not up right now, so tomorrow right. he'll go on the hood of the car for a minute or two, and it'll, it'll finish curing the resin, and then I'll hit him with a coat of cheap Krylon spray paint primer, and then I'll paint him with my myriad of really cheap craft paints. And I'm just going to scan through here go for it. and show this creative space.